Hello guys, thanks for joining. I hope you are doing well. This is a new lesson related to the teaching profession. So this is this lesson or this video is devoted for future teachers or teachers in general, teachers of English, I should say. All right, so um, today's lesson, as you can see, so we are going to talk about the difference or the differences between approaches and methods. And by the way, this is something that I have been asked several times in a lot of comments. So a lot of people ask me to do this uh, lesson, the differences between approaches and methods. And I am going to tell you why this is a confusing topic. Now, before we start, I'd like you to keep in mind two very important things. Number one is that if you are interested and you want to understand this better, I advise you to watch the video from the beginning till the end if you are interested and you want to understand this better. This is number one. Number two, um, what you are going to find or what you are going to see or what you are going to hear now in this lesson is my personal understanding of this topic. It is my personal endeavor to help you understand the differences between approaches and methods, okay? So I hope, I hope you find this lesson easy. I hope you um, break down this ambiguity between approaches and methods. Okay, now when you read literature or you read articles or maybe books that have to do in a way or another with approaches and methods, you always find a very highlighted statement or idea that is approaches have to do with theories, okay, have to do with theories. This is very important one to remember. Theories have to do with theories and methods have to do with what we call practice, have to do with practice. This is something that you find a lot when you read articles or documents or maybe literature in general about the differences between approaches and methods. So this is very essential, very essential difference between approaches and methods, theories and practice. Now here, when we talk about theories, we mean theories about the language in general and theories of learning, of language learning and teaching. So this is what you have to keep in mind. This is what you mean by theories. So approaches are general theories, or we can say philosophy of language and learning. Here again, methods, we are talking about practice. That's something to do with practice. And when we talk about practice, this, is, this leads us to the classroom, something that we do in the classroom, okay? So this is one difference. Now, in order to understand this better, I invite you to these elements. Let's look at these um, four elements. So here we have, as you can see, this is the teacher. This is the textbooks which reflect the language, English. We are talking about English. Here we have students and we have the classroom. So for sure, when you think about these four elements, you understand that there is a kind of interaction between these four elements, or there is a relationship, or what we can say there is a mutual effect between these four elements. We can also say that these three ones, the teacher, the English language, the subject, and the student, all of them interact in the classroom, in the classroom. Now, the most important one in these three elements is the teacher, because you who are watching this video are for sure teachers or maybe future teachers. So the most important one here for us is the teacher, because this is something to do with a teacher. This is something that the teacher needs to know. All right, so uh, the teacher. So before the teacher goes to classroom to teach the subject and meets his students and achieve his objectives or goals, that is to help students learn English better, for sure he goes to the classroom with some, we can say, with some thoughts, all right? With some thoughts, okay? Or we can also say with some ideas, with some ideas in mind, or we can also say with some, we can say a philosophy, with a philosophy 
of teaching. So every teacher goes to the classroom with ideas, with thought. Thought about what? For sure, thought about the subject, the English, the language that he is teaching, how is it learned, how um, he, it is taught, and also the knowledge about students, difference, differences between students and how students learn the language and so on and so forth. Also, the classroom. He has an idea about the classroom where he is teaching or the school where he is teaching. All right, so this is what we mean by thought or ideas. For sure, he has a general philosophy. All these shape a philosophy his philosophy of teaching. So I still remember when I was studying at the ENS, uh, we had to submit a portfolio at the end of the year. And part, a very essential part of that portfolio was the teaching philosophy. So every teacher has his or her own teaching philosophy. How do you perceive and conceive the teaching and learning in general? And these thoughts, ideas and teachers philosophy in general affect affect the teacher how affects him or her in his actions and practice in the the classroom in his classroom okay so here we can go back to the method and we can say also that these thoughts and ideas and philosophy participate and interfere in the teacher's thought choice of the method. So when the teacher chooses a certain method, he chooses that method based on his philosophy of teaching, based on his thoughts and ideas. Okay, so a method, as you can see, it is what? It is very simply, we can say it is a link. This is very important to remember. It is a link, link between what? between this practice, the practice in the classroom, and his thoughts, his thoughts and his philosophy of teaching, the teacher's philosophy, not only this, with another thing, which is theories, theories of language, learning, and theories of the language. I am going to give you a simple example to understand this. For example, for me, I believe that the use of the mother tongue in teaching English or teaching any foreign language is not good, is not appropriate for learning and teaching. So for me, I believe that the use of English for teaching English is better. So this is my part, part of my philosophy of teaching. This philosophy, my philosophy of teaching, for sure, affects my way, my style and the method I use for teaching students, for teaching students. In other words, it affects my practices in the classroom, my actions, I can say, my actions in the classroom. For example, I can use pictures, I can use gestures, I can use uh, maybe um, realia, and I help students to listen, and so on and so forth. So these are examples of actions that are based on my philosophy of teaching. Now, this is not enough, actually. This should have what should have a link with some theories of language and language learning. This is based on uh, Stephen Krashen's hypothesis, which is the Dean in Head. The Dean in Head. If you search for the Dean in Head, you will find that Stephen Krashen's Stephen Krashen say that um, when you expose student to um, uh, meaningful input to meaningful input or an input in the target language, for sure he, the student, keeps some words and expression in his mind. And when he or she goes out, they might repeat that expression or that words he listened to in the, or he was exposed to in the classroom. So this is the theory based, this is the theory that I base my action or my practice on. Okay, so this is what we mean by theories and practice. Number two, and this is also very crucial to understand, is that when we talk about approaches, approaches are what? Are general, are general, or we can say big. Just remember this word, very important one, big or general. On the other hand, approaches are what? Are specific, we can say specific, specific and here big we can say here small we can say this word small 
to understand this better. So methods are specific and approaches are general. When I say general, this is what I mean before, theories, general theories and general uh, philosophy of language and language learning. All right, now here, just keep in mind that when I say this one is general and this one specific, so for example, this is an idea that you have to keep in mind, for instance, and this is part of the confusion actually, so um, we can have one approach, general approach, that can be broken down into, into what? Into methods, into methods. For example, we can take, um, as an example, we can take the affective humanistic approach, the affective humanistic approach. This is a very general philosophy of language and of language learning. For example, it says that we should pay attention to the student's feelings, all right? And students learn when they are feeling good in classroom and so on. So this is a very general philosophy of language learning, the affective humanistic approach, humanism, affective humanistic approach. This is general, so this will be difficult for us to practice it in the classroom, to use it in classroom. So what should we do? We have to break it, we have to break this philosophy into what? Into methods, into methods, into specific methods. For example, the methods that were taken from or based on the humanistic approach, for example, the silent way and the Dissuggestopedia or Suggestopedia by Georgi Lozanov. So if your philosophy, if your philosophy of teaching is matches with this approach, which is the humanistic approach, for sure what you are going to do, you are going to choose a certain method, either the Suggestopedia or the Silent Way or the CLL, or maybe you, you take an idea or a way from or a technique from each of these methods and you apply them all together in your lesson and this is what we call the the selective way or the eclecticism or the eclectic way i should say all right so this is what we mean by general and specific so if you understand these two ones it's great another difference another difference that i'd like you to keep in mind is that for methods we always have founder the founder of each method. As I have just told you that, for example, the Silent Way was founded by Catinio, the Silent, the, the Suggestopedia, Georgi Luzanov, the uh, TPR, for example, James Asher, and so on. So every method has founder, has its founder. On the other hand, approaches now. We can have one approach um, shaped by a lot of scholars and a lot of researchers. We can take the example of communicative approach. It was shaped by a lot of scholars, I feel theories of a lot of scholars, like, for example, the Halliday, functional um, linguistics, and also Chomsky, the competence, the linguistic competence. We also have the uh, Delheims, the sociolinguistics, and so on. So all these scholars participated to shape the communicative approach. So communicative approach is, as I said before, general. But so far, we have not finished. We have not finished, why? Because it is not sufficient for you to understand approaches and methods if you stick to approaches and methods. We should study two other terms, number one and number two.